Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Road to Damascus for our Bible study, our weekly Bible study. It is 7.01. Uh, so uh, we could go ahead and get started. Let me go to my phone so I could uh, share this online as well. And we will go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Uh, all right. Uh, Lord God, we thank you and bless you for this time that we have together. We thank you that you have kept us since Sunday, that we've made it through the midweek. Uh, thankfully, we've most of us have not had any bad news. When we pray for those families that are dealing with tragedies, that things that have happened beyond their control, and we thank you for the health of those who we love, and pray that those who are are ill right now, that may be suffering from ill health, we pray for their healing. We pray for the restoration, but we pray more than anything else, God, that your will be done. Now, be with us as we study your word, that we begin to understand more about who you are and who you want us to be, that we may transition and transform into every thing that we're supposed to be to give glory to your name and build your kingdom here on earth. Help us to understand your word and your Holy Spirit will come, that we will be able to discern all things and get wisdom and understanding in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. So, uh, doggone it. Hold on. Hold on a second. There we go. All right. Uh, so welcome again. So we are, we are continuing in our study of the book of James. I'm glad to see uh, those of you who are who are with us here uh, in the Zoom room and those who are joining online via Facebook and those who will end up watching uh, later on on YouTube when we put it up on on the YouTube channel. But we've been in in the book of James. Uh, we're up to chapter four. And before we go forward, uh, for tonight, is there uh, anybody that has any any questions about what we've done, where we've been, or any any observations before we move forward with tonight? All right, no problem. So we'll go ahead and move forward. So we were uh, last week uh, in James chapter four, and we finished up in the section. Uh, where James is telling us about judging each other. Uh, it says, do not speak Ill, evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge one another? Uh, just reaffirming that, God is supreme and that God is the supreme lawgiver. He is the creator, the lawgiver. He is the one that sits in judgment. But the, the audacity of us as believers, as Christians, to think that we could actually uh, have the position of the right to judge anybody or anything. Uh, and and he, he says that we, we, we speak evil of a brother and, and judge our brother. It, it, isn't it interesting that he puts uh, speaking evil and judging people in the same context, the same sentence? So whoever, he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother, he, he puts both of those in the same sentence, combining them together to say that when you're judging somebody, it is on par with speaking evil and speaking evil of somebody is on par of judging people. And, and if you think about it, uh, our conversations and how we've behaved and, and the, these private conversations we have uh, when we're behind other people's backs and talking about folks, uh, I bet you never considered that the judgment and the speaking evil are, are synonymous that just just simply i'm just just gossiping i mean as we, we we try to gloss over so many things in life and just label it as as something innocuous you know it's 
It's just gossip. No, we're judging and we're speaking evil of people. And, and he's putting them all the same. It says that when you do that, you speak evil of the law and judges the law. And, and, and here again, this simple gossipy conversation is now on par, as he said, with judging the law, the law which is given by God. But we, we don't think about these things. We don't consider it as just part of who we are. We just talk about people. We, we, it's just kind of how it is. It's not right. But many of us won't take that position. And he makes it clear in verse 12 when he ends this section, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. We don't even have the power to save ourselves. You, we don't have the power to wake ourselves up in the morning. We, we see how little power we have, how little control we have. I mean, just, just look at the average American. And I'm throwing myself in there because I fall into that category of the average American. The average American is, is severely overweight. And, and in our control, our, our so-called control, we can't even muster the strength to stop eating to lose weight. We can't even muster the strength to get up off the couch to go outside and walk around the block. But yet we want to put ourselves on par with God. And I know nobody ever thinks about the fact that when you're gossiping about somebody or when you're judging someone or when you're speaking evil of someone, you don't think about it in terms of that you're putting yourself on par with God. But he says, there's one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Because you can't do nothing. You can't do anything. There's only one lawgiver. There's only one creator. There's only one God. He is the one that created everything. He created the law. He is the one that's going to judge at the end. Who are you to have the audacity to judge someone else? I always find it interesting when we, when we talk about judging each other that a lot of times you have these conversations with Christians, they really get defensive. They have no scripture, but they have attitude and emotions. And whenever I, I talk to someone and, and I, 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 we get into a so-called spiritual or a theological debate, I always ask, where's the scripture? Show me scripture. And, and I've actually had someone tell me, well, I said what I said and I mean it. I said, well, I don't care what you said because what you say to amount to a hell of beans, in my opinion. What I want to know is what does God have to say about it? What does scripture have to say? I, I, I said what I said and you can't change your mind. I ain't trying to change your mind. I said what I said and you can't do nothing. I ain't trying to do nothing about it. But when I engage in a conversation like that, I quickly disengage because I realize I'm arguing with a fool. And I'm saying that as, as, as uh, lovingly as I could potentially can. Because there are some people who are literally fools. They are not motivated by scripture or truth. They are motivated by emotions. The word of God specifically says, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? All I ever ask anybody to do, give me scripture. Get out your feelings and your emotions and give me the word of God. And if you can show me in the word of God that what I'm saying is incorrect, then I will acquiesce. But if all you got is your feelings, Sceva had his feelings and him and his sons got beat down by a demon. Feelings don't mean anything. So let's, uh, let's uh, any, any comment before we get to the, the new section for today. All right. Oh, no, no, no. I was trying to unmute. So when you call people fools, are you judging? No, I'm, I'm making a okay. definitive, I'm making a definitive statement on their level of ability to argue uh, scripture versus emotion. Okay. All right. 
of course, of course, I'm using words and, and justifying what I'm saying, but there, there is a a, a, a a level of truth that has to be accepted. There, there are going to be people who are righteous and people who are unrighteous. It is not my position to determine whether you are a righteous person as long as I'm living my and trying to become more righteous in my action. But I can discern if you are foolish. Because Proverbs tells us that we're not supposed to uh, argue with a fool because nobody will know who's the difference between the two. Okay. So you need to be able to discern people in your life who are fools. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> now, I may not call you a fool to your face, but I can tell you, if, I'll, I'll just simply say this. If we ever get into a theological argument and I disengage, just already know that I, my, if, but in my mind, you're a fool. <laughs> All right. So uh, in the last section of James chapter four, uh, we see uh, what God says in verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow for what is your life. It is even a vapor it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So that finishes out the fourth chapter of James, and he's, he's talking about tomorrow. That when when I prep for this, I, I thought again about that song by the Winans tomorrow. Uh, it, it it popped into my head and then it popped out and then it just popped into my head again. And when when you hear the words of the the singer it, talking about all the things that he's going to do tomorrow, yeah, I'll, I'll give my life to Jesus tomorrow. Uh, and you think about all the things we talk about what we're going to do tomorrow. Tomorrow is the day I'm going to start to change my habits. Tomorrow is the day that I start my diet. Tomorrow is the day that I will start reading the Bible. Tomorrow is the day that I will increase my prayer life. Tomorrow, I will start being a better person. Tomorrow, I'm going to be a better spouse. Tomorrow, I'll be a better uh, uh, child, a, a, a child to my parents. I'll be a better parents to my child everything is about tomorrow. I'll clean up my house tomorrow. I'll cook dinner tomorrow. You think about how many tomorrows are in our lives. It, so much that we don't do or say today because we're putting it off for tomorrow. And, and he's, he's not just talking about little things like that. He's, he's talking about people who make these grand plans. We, we already know where we're going to be this year, this is our plan, and I'm retiring next year, and when I retire, this is what's going to happen, and he's reiterating, you don't know what's going to happen. I know there's the old saying uh, that p old folks used to say, and my dad used to say it, probably still says it a lot, uh, but it used to crack me up as a boy. It says, uh, it's God's will and the creek don't rise. Now, I'm sure you know, country folk had a reason to be concerned about the creek rising. But when you're growing up in Los Angeles, what do I know about a creek rise? What do I care about a creek rising? Only anything that came closest to a creek is if we had a heavy rain and the water is running down the gutter uh, that may fill up the driveway where you had to be careful getting in and out of a car. Uh, that's about the extent of a creek rising for me. Uh, but still, James is going to the place or going to that point. He says that you need to, you know, you, you're in your plan. Don't be so arrogant to believe that tomorrow is assured for you. What you should be thinking about is if this is God's will, that you reiterate to folks as you talk about that I'll be able to do these things tomorrow if it is God's will that we'll be able to go here. If it is God's will, we'll be spending our summer here, if it's God's will, we'll be able to go out to dinner this weekend. And in my case, if it's God's will, I will be able to see my 55th birthday in a week. Now, most of us, we, we believe, and I've said it before in church, that 
we would go to bed at night and we just know we're waking up tomorrow because we have so many years of going to bed at night and waking up tomorrow. We don't even consider it a question of whether or not if it's God's will. It's, why would I even ask if it's God's will? Why would I even consider it being God's will? Because this is something that's automatic. But James is reminding us, you don't have no control over this. And when you just assume that you're waking up tomorrow, if you just assume you're going to live to see your next birthday, if you assume you're going to be able to see your kids uh, uh, get married and have grandchildren, that you're being arrogant. So why would, why would James bring this up as an issue of arrogance to assume we're going to live tomorrow, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line? Anybody want to take a stab? Why would he bring it up? Well, why why would he why would he consider it uh, arrogance? Because that's your plan. You don't. I think that's not God's plan. So you're. It's like you're setting your own path. Okay, that, you're you're on track. Uh, and, and let me let me go back and and think about this too. Because I'm sorry, my nose is just itching topically. So it, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm scratching my nose too much, but this itch won't go away. He says, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So I, I forgot to bring that piece in there. So let's, look, when you think about this now, that why is, is he really looking at this as not just arrogance, but the arrogance to boast about it is evil. Is it like we're putting ourselves on the level with God? Yes, exactly. That's this is this is the, the problem that we have with Satan. I mean, when we talk about the reason why Satan is who he is, is because he wanted he thought he was on par with God. And and he just reminded us when it came to to how we talk about folks, you don't have any control. And 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 the arrogant person, the, the evil thinking person believes that they actually have some control that it, we, we believe, now, of course, we have a little bit of science that tells us that if we eat right and if we exercise, chances are, not always, chances are that you might live a long life. But there was a young lady who was uh, Tuesday night was struck in Las Vegas, a football player for the Raiders uh, uh, at a, uh, twice the legal limit of alcohol in his, in his system, uh, driving at an extremely high rate of speed. I think it was reported he was driving 150 miles an hour on a street and ran into the back of her car, killing her as the car burst into flames because she couldn't get out and the flames killed her. Mm. Now, she, as far all we knew, we don't know anything about her, but she could be somebody who was a vegan, runner that, right. that, that and and plan to live for the next 50 60 70 years mm -hmm. and, and and james is reminding us you don't have that kind of control but here here's the bigger part of it if you believe that you have some control over whether or not you're going to live tomorrow uh the next day or you're going to see what your grandchildren grow and be able to when they bury you in your obituary is going to he leaves behind all these kids, great grandchildren and great, great grandchildren, because you're going to live to be a ripe old age of 106 years old through your power, then you have no gratitude. You, you're all, not only are you putting yourself on par with God, but you have no gratitude for what God has already given you. And you, we, we talk about thanking God my prayer usually every Sunday at church is thanking God for waking us up. But do we as believers really thank God for waking us up or do we wake up and just go about our day? Because that's just what we've always done. The most dangerous thing that can happen to, the, to a believer, a weak believer, is to have things go their way. Because it reaffirms their point of view. 
let me, let me rephrase that in a different way. Um, if I believe that I'm the one that's in control of my fate and that nothing happens to me and I go through my life charmed, as they say, a charmed life and nothing ever happens to me, that reaffirms my belief and that you don't need to believe in God. That this, this is just a myth. That this is just some stuff that people have, have created. You don't need this. But when we see people who have those attitudes and then things happen, they start having a change of heart. It, it wasn't so much, why is this happening to me? Maybe because you weren't grateful. James says, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. He told us earlier in James and up in verse four that you know when you're friends with the world, you're an enemy of God and you can't be a friend of God if you're arrogant and evil. Satan had to be driven from his presence because he was arrogant and his arrogance he considered evil. Uh, how many people actually, any of you actually think of yourself as being evil? I don't think any of, well, I don't. I, I consider myself arrogant, but I oh, didn't did realize according to the word that my arrogance is evil. Oh, well, I'm not arrogant. Humility has I'm, never I'm, been my strong suit. <laughs> I've known that. that that's that's it's never been my strong suit. It, it's I have been arrogant for the better part of my life. Some people would say I'm arrogant for no reason at all, for no reason at all. But then you know who who are you? You don't know me. You don't know what I got going on up here. And and most people, it my I'm so arrogant. I don't even care if you're a multimillionaire. I'm still better than you. Hmm. Somebody, somebody, Sean asked me one time. Why are you always talking about fat people when you fat? Because I'm a cool fat man. That's why. <laughs> Arrogance. But James is putting it on the line here. You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And one of the things that I had to go through in my or work through in my Christian walk is developing humility. That was something that I believe was missing in my life. I believe that that season of unemployment was put there in place to humble Ronald Thomas. Mm. Taught me a lesson. Yeah. taught me a great lesson, but it did show me who is really in control. Because when, when you don't have a check coming in and, and yeah, you get your little unemployment, but then unemployment runs out, but you're still eating, you're still meeting your bills. And you realize that that didn't happen by accident. And then to turn around when the jobs, when you, when you finally let go of self and start trusting in God, that letting go of the arrogance develops in some humility and realizing that if, if it's God's will that I get a job, that now I have three job offers in one day, literally went from an entire year of never having even an interview to just one day, three job offers come in, three good job offers that I had to choose from. Mm. But if we, if we think about this, he said, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So yes, I'm looking forward to my birthday in a little over a week. But if it's the Lord's will is the only way that I'll be able to see it. If it's the Lord's will, I may not be able to see it. But regardless of whether I see it or not, it is out of my control. And there's nothing I can do about it. He said specifically, your life is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. As we age, 
we begin to see more and more of how meaningful those type of words are. Because as a kid, it seems like you're going to live forever. You, you see somebody in their 30s and you think a 35 year old person is old until you're 40 and realize that somebody I, I even referred to someone when talking to a, a person, a, a friend of mine about a person who died in their six, the six early 60s. And, and he said, well, how old was he? I said he was a young man. Well, 60 really isn't young, but it becomes relative the older you get. Mm. Because you know people who can that live to 100. So if somebody at 60 dies, they're kind of relatively young in the span of a 100-year person, someone that's 100 years old. Uh, and especially 60 years old doesn't really seem that old when you're 40 because you realize at 40, I'm nowhere near old. And I still got a lot of life to live. But even in all of that, we don't even realize that life is just a vapor, but we become more aware of how quickly time goes by the older we get. These mm. weeks have been flying by. It, it's all of a sudden I look up here. For me, Wednesday's the day I set out my trash cans. It's like Wednesday, it's Wednesday already. I got to put the trash cans out. And then the weeks go by and the next thing you know, Oh, I got to pay my mortgage again already. And next thing you know, we're about to uh, file taxes again for 2021. Just like that. My, my oldest daughter is pregnant with her second child. It was just yesterday that I was holding her in my arm. Holding her. She, could, she was so small, I could put her on my arm, just fit her whole body in my arm. That was just yesterday. I mean, it was 30 years ago, but it was just like that. I remember it so clearly. I remember what I had on. I remember seeing her face and looking at that beautiful little face of how am I supposed to protect and raise her? And here she is getting ready to have her second child. Life is just a vapor. We have no control over what's going to happen. We have no control over how things are going to be. We don't know where we're going to be tomorrow. We know where we think we're going to be. And we may, in some cases, brag about where we're going to be, but it's all in God's will. Amen. James is just reminding us, don't, hmm. don't, don't brag. Don't, don't let your heart get so hardened that you forget to be grateful for every make waking minute that you have on this earth because it is great as God has given that to you. Not you didn't do it. He gave it. Don't put yourself on a level of God to think that you actually have any control whether or not you're going to live 75 years or 30. Because either way it goes, whatever time you have here, it's going to fly by. You'll hear and then you're gone. We're memory. Any, any comments? James has always been my man. Right. Let's move. Just a minute. We got Delonte want to say something. Uh, truck, my man. Dude, I just remembered today you had called me and I said I was going to call you back. And I hadn't called you back, so we got to touch base in the next couple of days, if it's God's will, bro. Yeah, there you go. What I wanted to add to that is <clears throat> time. Don't waste time, use time. In addition with that, we have to live our best life. Tomorrow's not promised. But we have to embrace what we have. We gotta, we gotta live it. We gotta live life. The things that we do, we have to do it with purpose until our father calls us home or his will be done. And we have to continue to trust him. Enjoy the life that you have. Be mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I believe that it goes hand in hand because everybody's different. Some people appreciate life, some don't. Mm -hmm. Those that don't, we see it, it clear as day. In this season, we have to continue to walk in the essence of our truth, continue to allow our souls to speak, and be humble. Mm 
stay humble. When you are humble, you will see so much. When you are humble, things will come clear to you. When you are humble, the spirit will speak to you. We have to. There is no other way as believers. We can't say that we love Yeshua, but do something totally different. Mm -hmm. It has to be one or the other. We can't be lukewarm. I used to be lukewarm. I ain't going to lie. I used to be lukewarm, but guess what? I had a rude awakening in 2019. <laughs> and when I heard that voice, will you trust me? We ain't talking about nobody else but you, the man in the mirror. So just wanted to share with that. It was on my spirit to share it. So Dang. good. That's good. Yeah, the we 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 take for granted so much. And part of of this arrogance is believing that you have tomorrow or next week or next month. And, and it's not guaranteed. Jesus already said, no man knoweth the hour. And since we don't know the hour, we that there is an arrogance of which we live our lives, believe that we have all this time. I, I, I would, I pray that God's will will allow me to be a grandfather that I'll be spending a long time, a long, good quality life with my grandchildren but there's no guarantee. And if God's will is for something else to happen, then we just, it has to be that way. I can pray for it to be one way, but if God says, nope, then I got to roll with it. You can't be so arrogant to believe that we can control it. We can't. I, I, I've thought about a lot, a lot about that young lady in Texas. I mean, in, in, in Nevada, in Las Vegas, She's just in her car, sitting in her car or parked a parked car, and her life was taken. Those kind of tragedies really, really, really get to me and really start making you um, think a lot and appreciating, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it should. It, it should. It should make all of us give us all pause to think about it because if I'll be 55 on my, on my, my upcoming birthday, like Delante was saying, if you're, if you're not living with purpose, you are wasting time. And, and, and what's when you, when you, when that time comes, not only are you not going to be able to answer, give an account for it, but you also will be leaving behind things that could have been, and, and we, we talk about this, we always experience these things when someone close to us dies, that in the immediacy of death, we all become very acutely aware of our frailty and the eventuality that we're going to die. So we, we talk and make all these plans about how we're not going to wait till the next funeral to get together. Uh, we're going to get, I'm going to, let's go have lunch. We're going to get together on these holidays. And then after the death goes by and time has gone by, and now you're kind of accustomed to the fact that this person is no longer here, we forget about all the things that we said we're going to do. And it's not just about the fellowshipping together, but maybe it was a plan to go back to school. I'm not going to waste any more time. Maybe it was to, I'm going to go ahead and start this business. I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to go ahead and, and go into school. I'm going to go ahead and start this business. I'm going to go in and repair these relationships before it's too late. I don't want to lose you before you really know that I truly love you and I'm sorry for what I've done. These, this, this arrogance that we're, in living our lives is what gives us the regret. And we see people have so much regret that they can't even function. They, 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 the regret turns into some gnawing issue that drives them to illicit substances, abusing alcohol, and in some cases, uh, illicit relationships uh, to, to, to hide the pain. 
the in, uh, in many in many cases the the grieving goes on and on and on too mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. And and that's we we can stop that, but the problem is, is that our our arrogance and and the more we're talking about it now, just realizing that when when he he's likening this arrogance to being evil, you see how it, it negatively impacts us and those around us to start to see how he can draw that conclusion because it, it negatively impacts each of us and those people who love us that are closest to us. And so it, it's, we, I, I love what Delante said, you live with purpose within God's will. Live with purpose within God's will. All right. So let's let's get on in chapter five, James chapter five. So first section, he's talking about money, 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 money. You know we we love money. We may not uh, worship it, but boy, we sure do love money. We love having money in our our bank accounts. We love having money in our pockets. Uh, I don't know about how how everybody don't don't brag about how much money you have or how much you walk around with, but I know there are some folks. They like to walk around with a grip of cash in their pocket because they, you know, they they just like having it. That's what makes them feel comfortable. Maybe it gives them a sense of security. Uh, but James is going to talk about money here. He says, "Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you." What miseries are coming upon somebody who's rich? They, they, they don't have anything to be miserable about, so we think, right? Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers uh, who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of the slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. <sighs> James it seems like he, he started out all the way back when we started in James chapter one, bringing some serious smoke. And he's continued it all the way through chapter five. I mean, he's, remember, faith without works is dead. They'll be sitting around here playing around church and talk about how much you love God if you haven't been doing anything for God. And now he starts talking about the folks who are sitting up with their money. Now, we know in the Bible, it says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Not, not money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And he's not even talking about folks loving money here. He's just talking about these people who are rich, who have been corrupt. They've lied. They've stolen. Uh, they've done everything they, they shouldn't have. It's, you have condemned. You have murdered. No one resists you. You have held back wages from people who have justly earned them. He even went as far as saying that the, yeah, the corrosion of your gold will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Kind of makes you think twice about asp aspiring to be rich, just in the context of just being rich and how we, we see people who are, are successful or I don't, I won't call them successful. We'll, we'll say the people who have accumulated a lot of wealth. It's almost as if he's saying that when you get to this place, the chances are you've probably done a lot of wrong to get to, to get this kind of money. So if we, if we study, you don't have to be a real student of history of the United States, but we do know uh, the United States, this fits purpose uh, perfectly in the context of what we are as a nation. I mean, they, they, they have shows on these Smithsonian Channel, the History Channel. They talk about the men who built America, the, the Carnegies, the Mellons, and uh, the Rockefellers. 
these men are thieves. They have built these, they, they actually built nothing, but they've uh, um, abused people and reap the, the rewards. The, when we look at the railroads across the United States, they, they brought in, uh, well, we had slave labor here in the United States. The, the, the power of the United States started from slavery, that the, they were able to get goods to market cheaper than any other nation because they had slave labor that gave them an economic advantage to what we still have to this day it set the united states above every other nation on this earth because of their ability to compete but they competed on the backs of humans there are people who made their fortunes because of the slave trade the north atlantic slave trade made fortunes and he he says you rich weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you do you know there was a study that just said that fully one-third of evangelical christians and i'm using evangelical to deter you know, it's we know the term what that refers to when we talk about evangelical christians that one-third of evangelical christians believe that there will need to be violence in America to protect democracy. One third, 33 people out of 100 believe right now that they need violence in America to so-called protect democracy. Now, these are the same people who are trying to keep, oppose voting rights that continue to block voting rights acts. So when James tells you, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. If we have 33% of a group of segment of the population believes that they need violence, sounds like misery is going to be coming. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be witnessed against you. Now, we know gold doesn't corrode. What he's talking about, that your, these people, their wealth will begin to wither away. It'll waste away. It, you see these people when they, they talk about who win the lottery, they win these multi-million dollar, uh, $100 million lottery winnings, and they're broke within a certain amount of time. This, this is what he's, he's not talking about stupidity, how they are, but he's talking about losing your money. He says your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped treasures in the last days. Now, where have we heard that about heaping treasures? Should be familiar to it, most of us who've been in a church in a while. If we go to Matthew chapter six, verse 19. Jesus said, do not, lay up do, up, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And here's James referencing what Jesus is talking about, that these, uh, you have heaped up treasure in the last days. What should we be doing if, let's, let's just, hypothetically say one day i was at a store and i bought something for the church and i had to return it and they gave it back to me in cash so i decided i'm gonna buy a lottery ticket for the church and the church won a hundred million dollar or a 200 million dollar lotto jackpot what should road to damascus do with a hundred million dollars Oh, gosh. 200 million dollars 200 million we could build us a church we could do a lot of good with that it's that's just endless it is mean ultimately is to do good right yeah right you should be helping mm -hmm. people see mm -hmm. what he, he's talking about jesus is talking about what james is talking about these people who are taking money and hoarding it mm -hmm. Right, right, and it right. just sits there, and and anything that just sits corrodes and and rots, and he's this stuff is just going to rot away, and it's going to 
evaporate in front of you. And it'll be a testament to who you are. This money that you had that you could have done some good, but instead it has just, you've wasted it all. You've wasted it and you've done nothing with it. And when you look at someone who has been given, almost like you look at someone who has this amazing talent and you, they just waste it. God has blessed you with all these gifts and this amazing talent and you've just wasted it. Mm -hmm. He said, it's a witness to you. It, it, it is a witness against you. And that's, it's surely what it is, is a witness. When we see somebody that has, has squandered everything that God had blessed them with, it's a witness against them. No, you, you can't even defend yourself against it. I, 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 I squandered what God had blessed me. Uh, for chasing that, that with heroin, shooting up heroin. I, I squandered away with it, everything God gave me because I couldn't stop chasing after women. I squandered everything that God has given me because I couldn't put down the bottle. He said, it's a witness against you. And, and, uh, and most of us, e even in our, you don't even have to be rich. You just, just where you are and, and think about how tightly you hold on to the things that God has blessed you with, as opposed to trying to help somebody sometime. Now, I'm not, I don't want anybody to come up here and tell me, I ain't telling you to clean out your bank account. I'm not telling you don't pay your bills or anything else. But we know that when we're somewhere, uh, you go out to dinner. I mean, can you go out to dinner for two at a fast food restaurant and not even spend, and spend less than 20 bucks? for two people. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's possible anymore. Mm -mm. But yet, that $20 we'll spend to go to Chipotle or McDonald's or Panda Express. And I'm not, see, I'm not talking about some high-end restaurant. I'm talking about some, some bottom rung stuff. We won't even help somebody on the corner. We don't even help people we know. It's There's always the the feeling I can't help this guy because they may shoot it up with uh, shoot it. They go 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 spend it on alcohol. But there are people we know that are not alcoholics, not drug addicts, and we just won't do nothing for them. They're responsible. They're not going to do anything with it. It is they're just lazy. If they wouldn't got a job, they wouldn't need me to give them five dollars. Mm -hmm. He says, this stuff is a witness against you. I mean, it's real easy to, to talk about what rich people don't do, but what do regular people don't do? You really don't even need. Road to Damascus is, is literally a case study in how a small church with small membership and small resources can still make an impact in the new community. And that's just this little church, but it still speaks to us as individuals. What can you do as an individual to make an impact in your sphere of influence? We, 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 when we, I don't see all of the, the, the deposits and, 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 and I don't see anything when, except for when it comes through uh, uh, Cash App that I can see who donated and I forward that uh, the, the information to, to Gwen as the treasurer. But short of that, I don't get this information, but when we, but we do know I could, I could literally look at what, where we are and realize that we're not a church that has people putting in a thousand dollars a week. Right. 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 <laughs> we we right. are not going to be able to on a, a one Sunday morning, and decide to raise some money and raise eighty thousand dollars. I've been in churches that have been able to raise eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in one service on one day. We are not that church, but yet, in our small but mighty condition, this little bitty church has had a greater impact on the community surrounding it than that very church that raised one hundred and twenty thousand dollars at an eleven o'clock service. You heaped up treasure. Sorry, go ahead. I said, and what do they do with it? Well, you know. That's just, that's just a yeah. rhetorical. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. They're you know, right. So they, they they they're not. Point is, they're not. They didn't do anything. They didn't do the right thing with it. <laughs> I'll just say that they didn't do the right thing with it, right. and and that becomes a problem because that's the type of when we it just in, like in my sermon was it this week? I think it was this week that when yeah it was this week when it, when Paul is setting up the churches and he's telling Titus and he's telling Timothy to to put these type of people in charge of the churches because these are the people who are going to be the example for the members. And if the members are being taught by crooks, the people are going to be crooks or have a crooked spirit and they'll be stingy and hoarders and trying to do whatever it is as opposed to having a leader who is trying to do something. Get these men in there. He said, get, get a man who's sober-minded, has married to one woman, raise good kids that are not lawbreakers and disobedient sober mm -hmm. even tempered is he's get, gave us the roadmap he said this is who you want leading the church because if these are the people who are leading the church then the members will model their behavior and so when we see this when he's saying he, he, you as rich folks have been setting up uh the treasures right now you've been heaping up treasures we, we see in our daily bible reading that we're in the section where Christ is being has been betrayed, and and if you read this, this, they're going to the house of this person. They're going to the house. This is where they're conducting the business of the church at the house, and the house is so big that it has a courtyard that people and all from all over can come, and in, including the soldiers can sit out there in the in the courtyard at this big house they have. And and I and I put in my comments on Facebook about one of the things about Jesus is that he said what why didn't you take me you know why are you coming with all these these soldiers and like i'm some kind of revolutionary but the fact of the matter is he's speaking truth and truth is revolutionary he's he came to disrupt what they were doing this he's breaking the chains of, of what do you don't be giving this money to them give the money here there's don't sit around here and, and put all pour this into here you this is what you should be doing that was disrupting the flow of the money to the church, uh, to them, the, the Pharisees and the scribes. We can't have this. Now, see, if they believed that he could preach Jesus all day long, as long as it wasn't disrupting their money flow. Mm -hmm. Having the, That's why Jesus went in and with the whips and kicking people out of the church. He said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have turned this into a den of thieves. They used to actually have the temple prostitutes. Temple prostitutes, let that sink in. <laughs> Temple yeah. prostitutes. What? Is it a wonder that we have literally have pimps in the pulpit? This this is nothing new. They had temple prostitution where they paid these women to have sex in the temple. Right. Anyway, James <laughs> is saying this this attitude is a witness against you. Said the indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And you think about it now. We're we're in this in a perfect environment right now. Everyone says our supply chain is disrupted because they can't find people to work. I saw a sign for McDonald's. They're hiring people who want to pay you twenty one dollars an hour to work at McDonald's, and and everybody, people, we. What is the minimum wage? How, how many years? The minimum wage hadn't changed in over 20 years. Minimum wage? Really? And they argue, said, well, we can't, we can't pay them more than this because it would drive us out of business or it's going to drive up the cost of these products. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever questions why a CEO of a corporation is justified in a $30 million salary. Mm -hmm. Right. Having gone to business school, I understand that they may have gone on and got a master's degree, but I can tell you no CEO is worth a hundred million dollar a year salary. They're not doing that much. I can read spreadsheets. I can read a profit and loss statement. I know how to do balance sheets. I know how to order products and do forecasting. I do all that at my level and I ain't in nowhere near that ballpark. Why are we paying or even comfortable with paying somebody 40, 
50, $60 million a year to so-called lead an organization, and all of us are workers, you know who do the work. They don't do the work. They, they have a vision, but the people who do the work are not being compensated. They, they're being lied to. He said, feed the wages of the laborers who mold your field, which are kept back by fraud. We can't pay you any more than that. You're going to drive us out of business. But meanwhile, Fat Cat CEO with a private jet or access to the company jet is making $60, $70 million with a bonus schedule that's going to pay him $100 million at the end of the quarter if the company makes these goals. But yet they're going to give you a 55 cent an hour raise. This is, we have had a pattern with this. This, this is not new. Jesus, I mean, here's James talking about this. In his time, this is the same thing we see now. People are barely living, working two and three jobs, just trying to be able to pay rent and have a family. And you know what our attitudes are? If you can't have a family, if you can't afford it, you shouldn't have a family. If you're working every day, you should be able to have a family. If you work every day, you know, there was a time that you didn't have to have a college degree and work a prestigious job to buy a house. Mm -hmm. how, are, how are young people supposed to buy a house in California today? They can't. Cannot. Mm -mm. You like to go to the bank is where it's cheaper. <laughs> What'd you say? What'd she say? What'd she say? Say it again, Sherelle. They do like me and move to Vegas where it's cheap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, boy. I used to live next door to a guy who uh, he bought a house in Temecula. Everybody he knew lived and worked in L.A., but he bought this house in Temecula because he wanted a house for his family and it was a brand new house. But he told me he totaled two cars on going back and forth because they, their life and traffic was so bad and that they never actually got to enjoy the home because their life was spent on the road. Yep. So they got up at 3.30 in the morning with their kids in their pajamas to drive to LA to drop the kids off at, at his mother-in-law's house. Then he would go to work, drop his wife off. They would go to, they had to ride together. Then at night they would come home and it would take them three and a half hours to go home. So that they would always every day are eating in the car, which was always fast food because they never had a meal at home. And sometimes he said he was so tired because of the, by the time he got home, it was after eight, but they're leaving at 3.30, 3.45 in the morning. So he's not getting any sleep. And he totaled two cars. Yep. Fortunately, he lived. But Let's this, sleep. Is, yep. this is the life that we have created. We have, we, and, and it's part of our own arrogance and greed to believe that because of this American dream, that we want to achieve this wealth that this guy had. So we all, it's okay for these other people to purposely uh, inflate over, charge us more than what prices should be and pay us less than what we're worth. Because one day we're going to be in that position when the fact of the matter is the system is set up that is not going to let you ever even get close to it. And James is to the wages of the laborers who mold your fields which are kept back by fraud cry out. And now these very same companies that are saying that they could for years, they couldn't afford to pay anybody above minimum wage are now trying to give you, we'll give you a $5,000 sign on bonus and pay you $22 an hour. Last year, you couldn't afford to pay minimum wage. Now you're saying you can afford to pay $22 an hour and a sign-on bonus? But still no benefits. Indeed, right. Which is the most important thing. Uh, and he says, you lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. That's kind of like the story of, of Lazarus, the, sec the other story of Lazarus, that he was he was so poor and he's outside the city gates begging until he was and so broke down the dogs used to lick his sores. All he wanted was just a crumb. And when when the rich man would, would despised him died and he saw Lazarus with Abraham and he says, that, you know, 
Father Ab- uh, Father Abraham, just just let Lazarus uh, get just dip water on my tongue to cool my tongue as he's in torment. He said, in your life, you had all the luxuries. Lazarus didn't have none. Sorry. And here's James. You have on you have lived on earth in pleasure and luxury, and you have fattened your hearts as the day of slaughter. But keep in mind, this applies to regular folk too. This is not just about rich folk. This is about this, how we live our lives and our level of generosity mm-hmm. or our level of stinginess. How, mm-hmm. how generous are we with people? How, how, how generous are we? And I'm not talking about the people we love because it's easy. There's it's no, who doesn't care? Who, who doesn't want to be generous to their own child? Right. Can you imagine Sherelle just brought her great showed up at church Sherelle and Tony come to church on Sunday and they bring BJ and, and Shania and Shania's little girl, their, their new granddaughter. It's mm-hmm. Sherelle, are you going to deny your granddaughter of anything that's within your control? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nope. It's, it's, it's easy to be generous to those who we love. My grandkids, come on now. Come on. I can't wait to have them all with me all of what however many is going to be if it's 10 i can't wait to have them all with me i'm all excited about thinking about what i'm getting zane for christmas this year hmm. it's easy it this is that's my grandson but how easy is it how willing am i going to be for somebody i don't know to make sure that they have something that they eat, have a Christmas, have some clothes, the clean clothes to wear to school, a new pair of tennis shoes. Should should only my children and my grandchildren be able to wear a, a pair of Nikes or Jordans to school because I happen to be their grandfather? I think by what we do, we show that we could go beyond our people that we love or even know based on what, you know, what we've done. And and I can say for myself, I would and I do. Because one thing about it, you know, most of our kids, grandkids or whatever, they don't need a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm more than happy to give someone who is less fortunate i am mm-hmm. uh, isaac said where is this job it was a mcdonald's in another state <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> hawaii's uh, paying at denny's they paying 21 dollars an hour hey now all of these places are hiring now all all of a sudden it's no mm-hmm. no issue because there's the nobody to work for it mm-hmm. so um, well, there is a McDonald's on Long Beach Boulevard. It has a banner that says, uh, paying anywhere from 15 to $24 an hour, no experience. Mm-mm-mm. I told you that yesterday, Ike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, but uh, James has got a lot to say. And he's yep. given us stuff to think about and how we behave and how we relate to each other. And, and I, what I want to leave you with tonight is to think about in your heart how you can be a blessing to somebody else. Now, you don't have to be rich. You don't have to have a whole lot of money. It doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything to be nice to somebody. That's but right. even but even in the abundance of what you have, or even in the, the little bit of what you have, I want you to think about how you can be a blessing to someone who has less than you. We're mm-hmm. coming into the season of Thanksgiving. We're, we're coming into the holiday season. And, and the very first one is Thanksgiving, the day that we're supposed to show thankfulness and gratitude and all that we'll be grateful for. And most of us will be at, at homes where there's gonna be an abundance of food, more food than we're ever going to eat, even with people fixing plates and taking it home. What are we gonna do? What can you do for someone less fortunate than you? Just think about that. Think, let, let that marinate in your spirit on what you can do for somebody less fortunate. 
and, and, and be purposeful in it, not just for the purpose of thinking about it, but putting that purpose to action and doing. That's what's supposed to set us apart from the world, the actual doing. That's how we show that our neighbor, we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, the doing. This gives us a purpose to do something today and not tomorrow. And helps, gives us, uh, gives us a legacy. It's, it's kind of very difficult to find someone who actually need because you know that organization angel tree we took i had a family you go to their house and you know they tell what the kids need whatever whatever and you go to that house to take their gifts and they have an abundance of gifts so that's why i say it's hard to choose i've been through that situation three or four times and i'm like dang they got more than kind of like the average kid. Mm. But it, it's hard to find someone who really shows that they need it. It, it really is. Oh, mm -hmm. I think with uh, for, for our purposes, uh, because of the fact that we, we know educators that have been associated with our church, that mm -hmm. we could go through them and find kids at their school who are mm -hmm. in need. Well, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I like to help people who need help, mm. not just because, you know, they like, I, mean, well, I just like to help people who really need help. Yeah. Well, we have discussed before me and Chantel and uh, Judy, we discussed uh, having, like you said, some of your educators find us a family, mm -hmm. a family to help. And, and I'm, when I say family, it can be the, a man in the house as well. It's just they don't make enough money. Like mm -hmm. you said Sunday, that people who, everybody who needs food from the food bank uh, is not that they uh, don't have a job, but they just don't have enough money to buy food, to buy the amount of food that they need, and especially if they have children. So we need, we, we, we need to get a family. And, I, and I'm talking about the whole year. So this time next year, we already have a family that we're going to help through Thanksgiving, through Christmas, the whole nine yards. And to me, that, that, I, would, I, would, I really would like to see that happen. Start, starting out January 1, mm -hmm. helping a family with children and a father and a mother who just need help, period. Or what and about I, a what about a single mother? Well, a single. Mother. She was just saying that we're not excluding it if a man. Oh, oh okay, okay. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact too, Mom, that you were saying for the year or for a long period of mm -hmm. a time, yeah, to help them one time. That'd be great. All right. So I'll I'll say this: two things. Mm -hmm. One, we don't have to wait to January second that that something we can start tomorrow to actually we start got to find, we got to we find the person yeah. first no uh, yeah i mean that but that's we don't have to wait till january 1st to start the process of finding we can send an email tonight and get I the see. process going because christmas mm -hmm. is a month away we can, right. we can literally be a blessing for somebody's christmas right now without having waiting mm -hmm. until next year and then still go through the whole year that's mm -hmm. number Amen. one and number two yeah. is we just got to talk. We don't know tomorrow's not promised. So let's not wait. Let's That's move. Right. That's right. That's Man. number two. And I, I said two, but it's three. And number three, somebody do it. It can't be me. I can't do it all. So That's right. somebody, well, yeah. mm -hmm. somebody's got to step up and do it. That's right. Amen. So we got three things. Somebody's got to step up and do it. We can do it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we can also try to search out. We need somebody I, I, besides. Well, Kimiko, you know Kimiko's an educator. Kimiko's an educator. Kimiko's an educator. Monica, Monica, an educator, and and Deborah's uh, uh, niece that was that had used to teach at that school in Compton. I, I know I don't think she's at that school anymore, uh, but she would still have access or uh, wherever school she's teaching is uh, probably still in the same type of condition. So we got three resources, Deborah, Monica, and Kimiko. 
and um, uh, Denise. And Denise, but she, oh, okay. but uh, mm-hmm. through Judy, we can access that through Judy. So, mm-hmm. and actually, I could go around to the school, this little elementary school, LaSalle. Okay, around the corner. We're, we're yep, we're on it. Okay, See? Mm-hmm. so this is this is set it, this is set in motion. That's right. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Right. All right. So uh, that's it. We're after eight. Um, I got an early day tomorrow uh, dealing with these uh, Samsung people. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up in prayer. Uh, Delante, all right, is Delante still there? Yeah, he's still here. But okay, we- I just want to remind, we got to touch base. I just, I realized that we hadn't. So remember, we got to touch base. And um, I see here, looking at the list. Okay, all right, that's, yeah, it's a truck. We definitely got to touch base. And uh, let's go ahead and close it out in prayer. So before we close out, um, I just got a text message from my brother. We just lost our grandmother. Um, Helen, Helen's mom passed away. She was in ICU when we were there this weekend and they were saying they didn't think she was gonna make it out. And so they just texted me and she just passed away. Mm. It was prayer for our family. Um, through this again you know i'm like i'm still not even over my mother and here i am with my grandmother now how old was she 26. she lived a full life she lived how many 96 years old oh wow wow okay all right praise god all right so let's uh let's go to the lord in prayer lord god we thank you and bless you we thank you uh for the book of james that just been pouring into us these last few weeks. Thank you for the wisdom that comes from these books that help Amen. us to understand and, and get the wisdom of what it means to be a Christian and how we can be better. Lord, we just thank you so much for, for what you're going to do in our lives. We thank you for the wheels that are in motion right now for a family that is going to be blessed throughout this holiday season and into the next year that we pray for that, that you will put the people in front of us, God, that will be the people in need, the people that we can help, that we can make sure that the children have clothes, that they make sure they have food to eat, that they will be blessed in the holiday and have a Christmas that children are used to having, that not only will they get the material things, but they will be blessed in the spirit. God, that they will understand that this is a God move, that you are behind this, and that you will receive the glory, and that they will develop a heart of gratitude uh, because of the goodness of God, because of the greatness of God, because of how you have imparted this spirit of, of generosity into the people of God, the people who we call Road to Damascus Church. And we thank you right now in advance for the people and the family that we're going to bless. Uh, because of you, God. And so we also lift up Sherelle and her family. We, we thank you for the life of her grandmother. 96 years on this planet, God, we thank you that you have blessed her with the strength and courage to survive throughout this time. And we pray that her soul was saved, that she is meeting with you right now in heaven in glory. But we more so, God, we pray for the family that is left behind, that they will get a double portion of your grace to go through this time of loss, that they will remember and accept that it is your will that this thing has happened, that we are born yet to die, but it is your will that she be gone, that she is no longer here, where she no longer has to deal with pain. She no longer has to deal with sickness. She no longer has to deal with the headaches of this world, but can just be with you in joyous peace in her glorified body, praising you and giving you glory, honor, and praise. We love you, Lord, for what you're doing in the lives of these, your people. And we pray for all those who are dealt with loss. We pray for the young woman who died in that car crash. We pray for the football player who has destroyed his life and pray that in in the end that he will find peace, that you will forgive him for his his actions, that he will be led to you, Lord. Uh, to repent for what he has done. We pray for all those who are sick, those who are going through illness, those who have gone on. We pray for the souls that are hanging on right now, God, because it is your will for what has happened. So Lord, we ask that your will be done. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, y'all. So that's it for tonight. Uh, this Remember this month, in the month of November, this is our first Sunday in November. We got Princeton Parker, who's going to bring the word. Uh, second Sunday is going to be uh, Reverend Dr. Charles Dorsey. Third Sunday will be our very own Pastor Chris. 
And the last Sunday in March will be our good, dear friend, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Pastor Lance Reed. So we got the whole month of November covered. And then the first Sunday in December, uh, it'll be all, all of uh, the Founders Day weekend for my fraternity and all the brothers are gonna be there. I'm probably expecting about, you know, somewhere between 35 and 50 brothers. And I got a special, special message uh, just for that day for the members of the fraternity as well as the church. So even if you can't uh, be there in person, you will want to get this message online. And then that second Sunday in, I, I told y'all we were going to be done with grace, but as I was going through my reading, the second Sunday in December, we're going back to grace because we're going to talk about grace under pressure, grace under pressure, uh, because we're not done with grace because apparently grace is not done with us. So we exactly. might end up in the yeah, exactly. 2021 yeah. all in grace and uh, and thanking God for for the grace that He puts upon us. So November is just going to be jam packed with some some good speakers, some good word. I'm looking forward to to it to get fed, and then December we'll finish 2021 as we go into uh, our year of revelation is our theme for 2022. The year of revelation as we go into our uh nearly year-long study of the book of revelation we're going to take revelation verse by verse and we're going to take this dissect it, read it digest it understand it and you you by the time we finish studying this you will be equipped to talk about revelation with any and everybody who has a question or challenges you you will be equipped to be able to handle that discussion. You. Amen. Amen. You. Okay. <laughs> verse Amen. by verse, you be able I'll to take it. it all and tell them, no, 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 bro. I done studied this. I done read this. I know what this word says. You ain't mm -hmm. fooling me. Let me tell you. Yeah, you y'all are going to be equipped for this. So with that, uh, look forward to seeing everybody on Sunday, whether you're in person or online. And, uh, and pray that uh, Brother Princeton uh, bring a mighty, mighty word, because he did last year, and I know he's going to do it this year, too. So with that, we'll go ahead and end tonight. Love all of y'all, and I pray that God continue to bless you. And I pray, if it's God's will, we'll see each other again. Amen? Amen. 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 Y'all be Thank good. God. Thank God Amen. for you, Pastor. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Good night, tell, everyone. Can I tell you one thing? Hold on.